So now let's talk about Rubens. You've heard the term a Rubenesque woman, and that just means kind of a larger, voluptuous woman. Well, that came from this guy. He was a Flemish painter, and his work is similar in style to that of Bernini. So he became a painter while he was still a teacher. And in many ways, his life was similar to Raphael. They were both sort of genteel, uh, very gracious people, and they ran in the ar aristocratic circles. Rubens used this popularity to his advantage, and he became very rich. Now, he was assisted by a large group of workshop painters, so we don't know what's actually painted by Rubens' own hand and what was done by one of his skilled assistants. Although he was treated as royalty, he was also known to be kind and rather philosophical about his success. Now, I love this one to the right because it's so doggone odd. It's one of a series of 24 commissioned by Marie de Medici. Now, she was the regent, uh, the temporary ruler for her son, who was the young Louis XIII of France. Now, she's portrayed in the frame portrait. You see that woman in the portrait? That's Marie de Medici. And King Henry IV falls in love with this image and um, as they were supposed to be married. They were, it was like an arranged marriage, you know, a marriage to help secure the aristocratic connections. So here she commissioned this painting where she's got, looks like a couple, Zeus, his wife, peacocks, angels, cherubs, some kind of a mercury, all surrounding this guy. Uh, King Henry the Fourth, as he falls in love with the mere picture of Marie de Medici. Wow! There you go. There's humility for you. But anyway, that's another story, and that's Rubens. Hey, let's look at ceiling painting. Just again, it's so doggone odd. Uh, Baroque ceiling painting went far beyond even Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. What we do here, what we see here, is that they've combined architecture with the uh, painting itself. So they're going to use the columns to support the painting. And this one on the left is very beautiful. It's a little hard to see here, but it's um, done by the Franciscans and it's actually bumblebees because that was a part of what they believed. It's very got symbolic significance. And I can imagine sitting in that church as if the whole and it feels as if the whole ceiling is opened up and angels are coming in. All right, let's talk more about very rich people, okay? Here we go. Um, let's look at the Palace of Versailles. In, in 1868, Louis XIV of France, he began to expand a small chateau at Versailles. The result was this massive palace. And it had a 240-foot-long hall of mirrors. Now think about that. Almost as long as a football field hall of mirrors during a time when mirrors were very rare. It had a mile-long hand-dug canal, massive gardens, pools, a mock cave, fountains, a theater, and a controlled forest. Now, this was an extravagant home, but beyond that, the palace at Versailles was a symbol of his totalitarian power and the common people uh, grew to rebel against this. It was the time of Louis the 14th and 15th was the time of such excess that people really had to rebel because much of this was built on the taxes that were levied against the middle and the lower classes. So his, his successor was the child king, Louis the 15th, and he grew up to transform Versailles into a center of vain indulgence. Here we have a picture of the pool and Versailles. Now, in order to keep boredom of the nobility at bay, the nobility of the court of Louis XV spent lavishly on entertainment and diversions. So what he actually did was he required that like 250 noble men and women lived with him at Versailles. He did this to keep them from rebelling, to keep an, uh, some kind of a feeling of control. Now, they indulged in gossip and intrigue, and they wasted money that, as I said, was raised by taxing the merchant classes. The poorest people of France starved, and the middle classes of France supported the spoiled rich, and the richest lived a life of extravagance at the expense of the others. 
Eventually, this led to the French Revolution in 1789, which had a great impact on art. Okay, so part of that, uh, let's just say, in the French Revolution, a lot of the art was destroyed. But this is one of the common people. Let's talk about everybody else, the non-rich. There was these two brothers known as the Lenain brothers, and they were artists who specialized in depicting the common people. Here we have the procession of the ram. Now, this uh, affectionately shows a group of peasants on their way to the festival. This is the less affluent people in sharp contrast to the work of Rubens, but it helps us to imagine the lives of the farmers and laborers that really held up French society. These are the people who would eventually rise up in a violent rebellion against the ruling classes. Now I must say about this particular uh, painting, everybody's happy, but what about the ram? He doesn't have too much ahead of him, but um, <clears throat> I think he's going to the ram guillotine myself. Let's look at another one along this line. This is a very famous artist called Pieter Bruegel. Bruegel. He's a Dutch painter. And he imitated the work of Bosch, but he ended up specializing in this work that shows the peasant classes living their lives. This is called the Wedding Feast, and here he depicts the activity of a lively feast. And let me see if I can show you a few fun details. Okay, here's, here's the bride sitting all by herself, and if you could see this more clearly, she looks a little scared. Here's the musicians over here. Here's some guy pouring um, mead. Here's a little kid sitting on the floor eating. Some guy reaching a piece of bread off of the plate, etc., etc. So there we have the work of Bruegel. Now let's talk about one that you are probably familiar with, an artist known as Rembrandt. You know what? I love this guy. He's such a great artist. Um, Rembrandt van Rijn was a young Dutch contemporary of Franz Hals. Now he is remembered as such a great master because he could depict the inner life of his subjects. With Rembrandt, the characters take on more depth as they express their humanity in profound ways. Now another distinguishing aspect of his work is how Rembrandt used deep shadows in order to bring out the drama on the faces of his subjects. He was also a fine draftsman and printmaker as we see here. These two drawings show different aspects of the skill. Above we have the simple lines that, are, uh, that indic indicate first steps of this child. And on the left we have an intimate, intricate drawing of his wife Saskia. And now I'm going to take a little sidestep from the lecture and tell you that just yesterday I was privileged to hold in my hand um, a print by Rembrandt from 1627. It was like this uh, as part of an assessment that I'm doing on a collection of art in Kansas City. And it was such an honor to actually hold this work and to consider that the artist Rembrandt had physically touched it and made it. Now of course this work is in, in glass so I didn't touch the paper because um, someone who was in art conservation wouldn't touch a paper without wearing a glove or something. But I was so moved by that. And I just wanted to give you my little story about Rembrandt from uh, actually a couple days ago. Rembrandt's life, let's look at his life, not his art. He was full of so much sorrow. He lost his dearest loved ones time after time to death and disease. These two self-portraits show the sorrow and the strength of someone who endured great tragedy, yet his faith always seemed to pull him through, and his art seemed to strengthen with his losses. He was a Mennonite, and he remained strong to his faith throughout his life. Here are two examples of his work. Above we have the Jewish pride, uh, excuse me, the Jewish bride painted in 1665. This is a Jewish poet and his bride, but it probably also refers to a biblical event. Also, one of his losses, um, he lost his beloved wife, Saskia, and their son here, uh, who he lost when his, son, when his son's wife was pregnant with their first granddaughter. Now, he painted this painting just after he lost his son, so it is widely believed to be painted in memorial to his beloved son, who was the only of his five children 
that made it to adulthood. You see, he did have a sad life. So on the right, we have a more obscure piece, which I love. Woman Cutting Her Nails. This is a rare Rembrandt. You don't see this one very often. But I love it because it's just so ordinary. It shows an ordinary part of life so beautifully. Now that we're going to speak about Velasquez. Um, he had a style rather similar to Rembrandt. Now what we see with Velasquez is that his strokes, his actual paint strokes, are becoming more visible. I love this piece to the right called The Water Carrier of Seville. Now this was a very important person in a southern Spanish city because it was so hot you would need to have your chilled water and so he would sell chilled water on the streets. You can see he's kind of a ragtag fella, this water carrier, but what I love about this piece is how Velasquez captured this moment. He captured the light on the vessel and the light on the glass and he didn't have a camera. He just remembered or he posed people or however he did it. It's a beautiful piece. Now this one is another one, a very famous one by Velasquez and I'll go through it quickly because it's so darn odd. Here he's painting called Ladies in Waiting is the name of it. Here's what he's painting. Here's his canvas. Here's the artist himself, Velasquez. And the king and the queen are shown in this mirror back here. And then there's a figure at the door that's just leaving. Another interesting thing about this is that it shows one of the features of palace life. And because there was a lot of intermarrying, there was a lot of developmental disabilities, which is what the human body does when close relatives marry. So here we have a couple of the special people also depicted in a loving manner in his work. So now let's look at Vermeer. A good way to remember the work of Vermeer, and you will need to identify Vermeer's work, is to note that he worked with something called the Camera Obscura which was an early version of the camera. It did not record pictures, but it would project a picture upside down on a wall. So if you think about a photograph and the power of Vermeer's work, it's easy to see that he had a photographic influence. Now Vermeer is interesting in that we only have about 35 of his works and they're relatively small and they're almost all in this one home. The painting to the right is a very rare landscape, um, one of the few that we have left. Also, his work was relatively unknown, and then it was rediscovered, I believe, in the late 1800s. So let's look at a few more. Here's two more examples. Notice how he's painting the light and the shadow, and there's always a sense of symbolism within his work. In this piece to the left, the pitcher and the tray show a gentle reflection and on the right, notice the pattern on the cloth of the table. This artist is a master at painting the simple beauty in everyday life. Now let's look at the one on the right. He seems to be, it's a woman holding scales, and on the one side is a pearl. And who knows what she's balancing? Is she balancing her deeds, as we saw in the Egyptians? Is she simply counting money? Who knows? What we do know is that with Vermeer, there's often a feeling of a deeper significance to his work as well as what we see on the surface. And last, let's end at the end and the beginning. This is called The Avenue at Middle Harness by Meindert Hobima. And here we see Holland, a land that has been taken back from the sea. Here we can sense the power of nature as the people of the Netherlands have coaxed their livelihoods out of a land that has been reclaimed from the ocean, and yet that force of the ocean is never far away. We can sense its force in this painting. And here also we have a path, the path into the creative potential that continues to lead to parts unknown. All right, that completes the lecture on Baroque art. Thank you so much for listening.